Well, we have a lot of content to get through in 30 minutes, so we're going to get started. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, we're going to talk about some uh, fairly recent enhancements uh, in the Cloud Foundry routing tier uh, that, uh, as core platform features, provide new points of extension, uh, enhance uh, what uh, Cloud Foundry services can be, what kind of workloads can be run on Cloud Foundry. My name is Shannon Cohen. I'm a product manager at Pivotal. I've been working on the Cloud Foundry project for about four years. Came from VMware. And this is the uh, Cloud Foundry routing engineering team I have the honor of working with. Uh, we're an open source team. You can see we have contributors from uh, Pivotal, IBM, and uh, GE. We've also had uh, members of the team from EMC. And uh, other member companies. Uh, what does the routing tier do? As an introduction, before we get into the features, I'll give a brief summary. Uh, basically, we're responsible uh, for the components at the network edge of Cloud Foundry, making sure that requests for system components and applications running on the platform uh, get to where they're meant to go. Uh, this is particularly tricky for applications running on Cloud Foundry since, uh, among other things, as a container scheduler, uh, those the location of those application instances is subject to change. Historically, we've been responsible for a Layer 7 HTTP router, and uh, which is uh, dynamically updated. It also features uh, round-robin load balancing, though we've received a PR recently from IBM for an additional load balancing algorithm. Uh, supports SSL termination, web sockets, sticky, se sticky sessions, and transparent retries. Okay, the first uh, topic we'll talk about is route services. <clears throat> as an introduction, I'll tell you a bit about the opportunity we saw. Uh, as you know, Cloud Foundry Marketplace uh, provides a way for developers to um, reuse or consume services which are maintained by others so they don't have to uh, reinvent the wheel and don't have to be responsible for all the technology in their stack. Uh, but we identified a category of services which uh, wasn't available to developers. And those are things which uh, intermediate application requests. Uh, common use cases include rate limiting, authentication, and API, traf uh, API management. And we found that for operators, delivering these services in a one-off way was a burden. So our solution was to offer uh, these services or enable service providers to offer these kinds of services through the Cloud Foundry marketplace. So route services are a new kind of marketplace service that enables uh, developers to insert uh, these uh, intermediating, services, intermediating services into their application request path. And uh, by not having to uh, reinvent the wheel each time, this increases uh, developer velocity and minimizes time to market. This is a look at the developer user experience, the CLI. It uh, leverages uh, many familiar and existing workflows and introduces one new one. So discover, to discover uh, route services in the Cloud Foundry Marketplace, you would use the same command, CF Marketplace. And to create a service instance, you would use the same command, CF Create Service. The, uh, the new command that's uh, been introduced to support this class of services is CF Bind Route Service because uh, rather than um, interacting with these services, uh, uh, with having an application interact with these services, uh, we're, uh, inter we're uh, dynamically updating the Cloud Foundry routing tier uh, to proxy requests to these services. Uh, and the API object in Cloud Foundry that was most appropriate uh, to associate with these services was the route. This is the address for one or more applications. So the workflow is to associate the service instance with the route. We also support user-provided service instances so that uh, developers can leverage these kinds of services uh, if they aren't in the marketplace. A look at the management plane it hasn't changed. Uh, requests to Cloud Foundry are still sent to the service broker, which takes care of translating requests uh, to, uh, for provisioning to a service instance provisioning of a service instance. The one change here is that uh, the service broker can optionally return the URL of the service instance. 
If the broker does return the URL of the service instance, the Cloud Foundry routing tier is dynamically updated, as I mentioned. Uh, when it does a lookup of the backends for a particular route, it, identif it identifies that there is a uh, URL associated with the service instance, uh, excuse me, with the route, and proxies those requests to the service instance. After some transformation occurs, uh, the service instance sends the request back to the router and we forward the request onto the application. Responses from the application uh, travel back through the route service also, so services have the opportunity of doing transformation both on the request and the response. I will say that uh, requests between the route service and the Cloud Foundry routing tier are encrypted. If the broker does not return a route service URL, um, there's a use case for services which may uh, be pre-existing or be forklifted in front of Cloud Foundry. These are services through which all requests for the platform or applications may travel. Uh, it might be a transparent pass-through, uh, but through the uh, broker integration and exposing the service in the marketplace, there's still value in uh, enabling developers to configure that service for their specific needs uh, with familiar Cloud Foundry workflows. With that, I'd like to invite Prashant to, to give a demonstration of route services. Uh, Prashant is uh, from Apogee, and Apogee has been an early adopter of this integration. Thank you, Shannon. Okay, hi everyone. As Shannon said, I work with Apigee. I'm a principal architect with Apigee, and I help customers accelerate their digital transformation journey. Okay. Uh, so let me take a step back and talk about developers, right? So as developers, all that we, oops, sorry. So as developers, all that we would like to do is we write a piece of source code, and we want this to run on the cloud. We do not worry too much about how it actually runs on the cloud. But there are certain aspects that we do worry about, and that is we want what we are uh, running on the cloud to be easily consumable by other people. And one of the best ways to make this easily consumable is to expose them as APIs. Um, the very fact that these are exposed outside means that you do, do need to take that little bit of extra care and precaution uh, of these APIs. Apigee has a API management platform called Apigee Edge, and uh, we provide you with out-of-the-box features like analytics, traffic management, security, mediation, and you can even write your custom extensions. Um, what we focus on is that we want the developer experience to be great, not just for the developers of the APIs, uh, but also the consumers of these APIs, right? So in partnership with Cloud Foundry, we have built the Apigee Edge Service Broker. The Apigee Edge Service Broker is available as a route service on the Cloud, Cloud Foundry platform. Um, this can be used by developers and operators to easily plug in API management features on top of your existing applications that are running on Cloud Foundry. Shannon spoke to you about the developer experience. I'm just going to go and show this to you in a live demo. Uh, Shannon spoke about how the requests flow quickly in the context of Apigee. What happens is the request comes in to Cloud Foundry. You still make the request to Cloud Foundry. The Go router is able to determine that there is a service instance associated with this route. The service is proxied to the Apigee layer where you can perform your API management tasks. Once the API management uh, tasks are done, Apigee sends this back to the Go router. The second time around, the Go router knows that it has to be forwarded to the application uh, that's running on Cloud Foundry. Application returns a response, and the response follows a path, a similar path back out. OK, uh, so let's get into the demo. No. All right, so I will use the command line interface of Cloud Foundry. Um, oops, sorry. That helps. Yeah, okay. Um, I already have an application running on Cloud Foundry. Uh, let me show you what this does. It returns a simple JSON response, okay? Um, 
What I can do now is I can look at the marketplace for available services uh, that I can use. So I am looking at the marketplace. I see that there is a service available called APG Edge. I can look specifically at the service. I see that there is a service plan associated with it and it is currently available for free. What I can do now is I can go and create an instance of the service on my environment. Before that, let me quickly jump to the APG platform. And, okay. So this is the APG API management platform. Uh, right now, there aren't any API proxies available here. And uh, uh, this is where you will do all your API management tasks. Jumping back to the CLI, I am going to create an instance of the service. I specify the name of the service, APG Edge, uh, the service plan. I give the name of the service instance that I want to create. And I'm also passing in some parameters via a configuration file. This validates the right credentials are present so that we can start using APG API management. Uh, the next thing that I will do is now that I have a service instance created, I need to bind this to my route. So I will do this by the bind route service uh, parameter. I specify the domain and the route to which I want to bind, as well as the service uh, instance that I just created. What this will do is this is going to now create a proxy on APG. So when I refresh the screen, you will see that a new proxy is created. Uh, APG has an easy to use trace tool by which I can see the request flowing into the system and the response back out. Uh, let me make a curl again to this uh, URL. You see that I'm still hitting Cloud Foundry. I don't need to connect to APG uh, because I've done this. APG sits as a, a service on the route. Uh, the response has gone through APG this time, right? Uh, currently, the API proxy is uh, it's empty. There isn't much happening in here. Um, so to show you what you can do with API management, I'm going to add a policy. Now, APG supports a lot of policies like traffic management, security, mediation, and as I said, even your custom extensions. I am going to add a spikers policy to the route. Uh, I'm going to keep the threshold low enough, which is about 10 requests per minute. Save this and start a trace again. Let's make a few more calls to this application. We get a response, we get a response, and we start hitting the, uh, the spike arrest policy. So you see here that API management um, is in effect. And uh, uh, when I go back into the trace, you see in the first case, the request has come into APG from the Go router, uh, as what Shannon explained. API management activities are done on the APG layer. The request is sent back to the Go router, in which case, this time it's sent to the application that's running on Cloud Foundry, response comes back out. In case of a spike arrest violation, uh, you must excuse the uh, UI here. I, there are some things that are not being loaded. Um, what you will see here is that the response is not sent back to the application this time because it is a violation that happens on the API management layer. The response is immediately sent back to the client, of course, through the Go router. Okay, so this is how easy it is to use, uh, uh, to add API management features using the route services to your existing applications. Jumping back into the presentation. In summary, what you saw is that we create a service instance using the CLI, you bind the service instance to your existing route, and hopefully I also got you interested a little bit into how easy it is to do API management using APG. Okay, um, yeah. So how has been the developer experience developing these, the service broker itself, right? So Cloud Foundry exposes a set of APIs that you would need to implement in order to create your own services and service broker. Uh, APIs are meant to be easy to use. However, it's very easy to make them hard as well if you do not have the right documentation, the right security, and do not use the right HTTP methods. And in this regard, Cloud Foundry has done a great job at exposing really easy to use APIs. Um, it also helps that there is a good amount of testing and mock frameworks available. Uh, also, there is a local development environment available where you can do your uh, development and testing locally without having to push to cloud each time. Uh, you you got to click on the link. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't yeah. Uh, we can uh, share the slides, but this is a great uh, way 
don't refer to this documentation, but then this is a nice blog on how to make your APIs hard to use. Right? It's an, it's an anti-pattern, don't do that. Um, of course, uh, we are gonna talk a lot more about API management, a lot more features that you can do with APG uh, in the session tomorrow at 2.30 p.m. Of course, all this is using the route services provided by Cloud Foundry. For more information to build your own services or to read about this, you can refer to the documentation docs at Cloud Foundry slash services. Okay, that brings me to the end of my part. Hand it over back to you guys. Thank you. Thank you, Prashant. Okay, we're gonna switch gears and talk about TCP routing. So uh, first, wh what was the opportunity? Uh, traditionally, Cloud Foundry has been a great place to uh, operate and develop uh, HTTP applications. Uh, but there's a world of applications out there that depend on non-HTTP protocols. And it wouldn't it be great if uh, developers of those applications could uh, run their applications on Cloud Foundry also, uh, getting the same uh, high developer velocity and minimizing time to market. So our solution is support for TCP routing. These are uh, support for applications running on Cloud Foundry uh, that require non-HTTP TCP protocols and supports uh, many use cases including uh, uh, the Internet of Things uh, category of applications we're hearing so much about. Uh, we also believe that to satisfy a use case uh, wherein uh, uh, requests to applications need to be terminated as close to the application as possible. Here's a look at the user experience. Um, Management of uh, TCP routing is much the same as for HTTP routing, um, ex with the exception that uh, now there's a different kind of domain. When you're looking at the list of domains you can create a route for, uh, you'll see that uh, there's a domain of type TCP. And when you uh, push your application or create a route, uh, you would use this domain. Uh, TCP routes are uh, associated with ports whereas HTTP routes are defined by uh, hosts and paths. And for each TCP route, a port is reserved. So you can either uh, request a port or ask the platform to uh, allocate one for you. In the bottom command, you can see that uh, I'm pushing an application uh, and have specified a TCP domain and said that uh, I've asked the platform to give me a random route, and the platform uh, generated a, uh, a port for me and created a route from it. A little look at the, uh, the architecture of this. We've introduced some new components that we expect will provide uh, uh, in the, uh, eventually a point of extension. Um, there is already a uh, emitter which supports uh, HTTP routing. Uh, the function of the emitter is to uh, watch for events on Diego. Uh, this is how we uh, update the routing table when instances of applications are moved. And the emitter uh, sends those events to the routing API. The routing API is uh, intended to eventually replace NATs uh, as the, uh, the source of persistence uh, of the routing table. And the routers are watching for changes uh, in the routing table from the routing API, much as the Go router currently does on NATs. So the emitter is uh, a purpose-built purpose -built for Diego, uh, but you could use a client of your own of, uh, and send your route registrations directly to the routing API and register TCP routes. And it's just like, if you don't send it, it'll assume it's not there? And That's right. It works with the same heart beating, heart beating mechanism. So I mentioned uh, how TCP routes were based on ports. Uh, there's a couple of layers of... Uh, uh, port readdressing that goes on. You can see in this example, the client is sending a request to a domain in port. The domain is resolved to the load balancer, and the load balancer forwards the request to the routers. Uh, at the routing, uh, in the routing table, the router maps the uh, route port to a backend port, 
And that backend port uh, here is uh, an internal port uh, signed by Diego. And the application uh, is listening on uh, another port, uh, currently 8080. Okay, with that, I'd like to invite, uh, oh, Sorry, go ahead, was, please, Nick. I'm quite patiently, you know, like, so uh, constraints, obviously there's a, there's a fixed number of ports on the machine, and I heard on the ELBs, the Amazon ones, there was a, is there a, a very small range of ports? Really yes, there? unfortunately, Amazon does have a limited range of ports you can open per ELB. So we do expect that uh, if there's a great demand for ports, that port capacity could be an issue, and we're looking for that feedback. We have some ideas about uh, how to scale uh, port capacity, including support for what we call uh, router groups, uh, which would be uh, a cluster of identically configured routers, and you could potentially deploy multiple router groups and multiple load balancers. Currently, the routing API supports one, but uh, based on feedback, we can uh, we have good ideas about uh, how this could scale. Another way would be to support shared ports using SNI. I guess you could always have multiple load balances with each having different domain. Uh, you could, um, but we have a little bit of work to do in the routing API to uh, enable you to uh, support different port ranges. Um, for those load balancers for the same router group. I'd be happy to. Yeah, you, I would expect that you'd map the same port from the load balancer through the router. In the, for the particulars of uh, router groups and scaling ports, we should follow up after just so I, we have a chance to give the TCP router de the demo. Okay. Uh, Chris is our uh, lead engineer on the routing team. He's going to give a demo of TCP routing. All right, thank you, Shannon. Um, as Shannon said, I was on the, I've been on the routing team for about a year now. Uh, helped <coughs> develop and implement the route, TCP routing, and uh, happy to show it off here to you all. Um, so, quick overview of the demo before we actually get into it. Um, we will be doing uh, using MQTT protocol, which is a pretty common uh, non-HTTP protocol uh, for IoT use cases. In this particular demo, we'll use my handy dandy smartphone to publish on a topic to the MQTT broker on running on Cloud Foundry. And then we have another web app that is subscribed to that topic and will visualize the data I'm sending. So if we go over here, make it big. How's that? Looks good. All right, so the first thing we want to do is log in. So this workflow that I'm showing is the basic developer use case of creating an app, creating a TCP route, and kind of doing that whole workflow there. So first thing we need to do, find our domains. We see we have two domains, shared domains. One TCP is a type TCP, so we can create TCP routes from that. An important thing to note with TCP routes is that as we have limited ports, we have to divide them up. And, ooh, interesting. So you have a quota that is, uh, you cannot create TCP routes if you don't have certain quota set. So be aware of that. So let's push our MQTT broker. We are using a Docker image, which is pretty cool. Forgive my mistyping. Here we specify our TCP domain, Superman. And since we don't care what port we get, we're just going to request a random route, and the 
cloud controller will basically give us one that's free. And so this is just going through the normal staging, uh, pushing, starting lifecycle. We see here that we're binding port 60,028 to our app. And it started, we'll see, we get a URL with the port there. If we take a look at CF routes, we also have that output there in this field port field, 60,028. We look at apps, I have pre-pushed our, our web app, MQTT web. So if we go over there, have it, we reload it there. So basically what we're gonna do in here, we put our TCP domain, this is our port. I already forget what port it is. There, let me get my web app ready. Connect. Now I do the same thing on my phone. I wish I could show it to you. Uh, <laughs> You know, if you want to download it real quick. I believe it's on Google Play. So I'm connected. Ooh, interesting. Superman. Interesting. Now that is unfortunate. Live demos are going wrong. I'm actually not on the Wi-Fi because I tested it through the Wi-Fi and it didn't work. <laughs> All right, we'll try one more time. Uh, I don't know if it's the Wi-Fi that's the problem here. No, so this is, to be clear, this is not a service, this is just a route. It's the same way as HTTP routing. This is, as you pick your host name, instead of a host name, you have a port. So that's how we distinguish between the two. Hmm. Did you say you had a video? I do have a video. I don't know if we have time to pull it up, um, but, huh? All right, let's see. We can still clap and make it feel good. Oh yeah, that'd be great. Oh, it's gonna oh great, sorry. I thought he was gonna put his laptop on. No. Finder. Hey, so we skipped through that part. Oh, whoops, okay, let me. How do I get this going here? <laughs> All right. Where's my cursor? Oh, there we go. So let's take a look at this. Ooh. <laughs> we'll skip back. That was, the, that was the payoff right there. So we're doing the same thing here. And now we are going, I'm connecting on my phone, and suddenly we will see, oh, got to look at the port. Never remember the port. So there we go. Now this is me kind of frantically waving my arm around to generate graphs. This particular thing is looking at the Y acceleration of the smartphone. 
So those big spikes are me waving really hard. And so again, this is all, yes. So that was all very quick and easy, but this is now using a TCP protocol on Cloud Foundry, uh, specifically MQTT, but it doesn't have to be MQTT. Uh, you can have pretty much anything that runs on top of TCP, XMPP, DDS, all that good stuff. How do I replay this thing? So I, I can now run a mail server from Cloud Foundry? You could indeed. I have uh, actually talked to someone who had that idea and wanted to try it out. Um, but if you want more information about TCP routing or new routing features in general, we have our routing release here at github.com on the incubator site. Um, yeah, there's a demo. So we're out, uh, out of time, but I think I have one more slide just to give you a, an idea of what the routing team is working on. Uh, we've recently added support for Zipkin tracing. The router will now uh, optionally initiate Zipkin traces. It supports the uh, B3 headers standard. If your applications uh, use a Zipkin library, uh, you can propagate uh, that, those tracing IDs. We also added a little feature enabling you to uh, send a request to a specific app instance uh, using a particular HTTP header uh, that uh, takes as a value data that's available from the CFCLI. We're also currently working on performance benchmarking and improving uh, performance. We've had some great talks from folks in the community who are uh, doing some of the same analysis and uh, really appreciate the help. And uh, the next big rock that we're going to be working on is support for multiple app ports. This would enable an application to listen on more than one port and fulfills use cases like applications serving web traffic on one port and uh, s app instance specific data on another. Um, we're also looking into uh, support for uh, cert management. We hear that as a major point, pain point and looking for your feedback. Uh, we're also interested in getting uh, feedback about uh, weighted routing, which would potentially enable a developer to specify that they want 10% of their traffic for a route going to app A, 90% going to app B. And uh, uh, we also believe that the routing API could eventually support a bring your own router workflow if you would like to uh, even in the way out future, uh, choose from uh, a selection of routers in the marketplace. I would like an F5 uh, virtual appliance or Zool uh, and have that used for your application only. Um, we see a path towards that. We're looking for your feedback on that. If you have uh, feedback for us, uh, come see us after the talk or get in touch with us with Slack. Uh, here's my email address. Uh, feel free to get in touch with me. And uh, here's uh, our links for documentation on the presentations you saw today. Thank you.